let's get started. Uh, today is Thursday, November 4th. We've made it to the end of another week and we've made it to an end of another organ system. We are done with the respiratory system after the homework you've turned in today. So now we are on to the urinary system, which apparently I cannot spell. Um, we are gonna do the anatomy today and then the next two days we will then um, focus on how it functions. Uh, we have a nice long amount of time to master this material because Thursday the 11th is a holiday. Uh, so that gives you an extra day to study and master these two organ systems. Uh, and you have uh, a lot of homework to keep you busy during that time. Two more unit reviews and two more lab simulators, one on Labster and one on PhysioX. Uh, and again, the way the holidays fell out this year, we seem to have a fair number of uh, Thursday exams, and this is going to be another one of them. Remember, that means you will be getting new material on Tuesday, but remember, you also have your outlines and your slides and all those other things to help you to uh, prepare for this material ahead of time. So it shouldn't be the first time uh, that you are seeing it. Also, that also means we have a nice five day weekend before we come back to start the reproductive system. Uh, on the reproductive system, uh, we are going to spend a lot of time on the first day talking about meiosis. And from previous experience, I have found that most students have a hard time recalling the information that we learned on mitosis from 430. So to encourage uh, that uh, reminder, of uh, mitosis. You've got a labster that will be due on the 23rd when we come back and also a pre-lab as usual. And we'll talk about those in more detail when we get close to them. But that's the game plan for the next couple of weeks. All right. And then along that line, we have uh, two homework assignments, three, three homework assignments and uh, the four lectures of the reproductive system. And then we're done. You are almost done with anatomy and physiology. All right. Questions on any of that? Excellent, stunned silences. Either my mic's not working or you guys are all asleep already. Excellent, either way, I'm satisfied. All right, as I mentioned, we are on to the urinary system. Like all organ systems, there is the primary organ that is responsible for the function and the accessory organs. What is the primary organ or organs of the urinary system? Kidneys. The kidneys, absolutely. In fact, the kidneys are vital for the function of the urinary system. Uh, so much so uh, that, again, let's think about what we've learned so far. If you lost half of your heart, would you be able to survive? Not a trick question. No, absolutely. If you lost a lung, could you survive? Could you live with one lung? Yes. Yeah, probably. Would, could you be a professional athlete, for instance, with one lung? No. Probably not. Would it be easy to be a professional athlete with one eye? No, but it's possible. Possible. It would kind of depend on the sport. Anything that needed some depth perception, like catching a ball or hitting a baseball or hitting a tennis ball, might be pretty challenging. Uh, boxing uh, might be tough, but uh, maybe there's some sports, maybe you could get away with it, but a lot it would be really restrictive. But what about a kidney? Could you be a professional athlete with only one kidney? No. Actually, you could. You can lose a kidney, have it stolen from you on the weekend, sell it on eBay, donate it to a loved one, right? You can get rid of one of the kidneys in your body and the other kidney is fully capable of doing all of the processing necessary of the kidney. Now, going back, you might want to be careful being a professional athlete because if you damage the second kidney, then what happens to you then? That is true, absolutely, because you only uh, line up with one eye. What happens if you lose both kidneys? You die. Yeah, you would die pretty quickly within a couple of days, where we may be able to sustain you for a brief period of time with dialysis, but dialysis is not a long-term solution. That's a short-term stopgap until we can get you a new kidney. So these kidneys are vitally, vitally important, so vitally important that they're actually somewhat redundant. We don't see a lot of redundancy in, uh, 
in anatomy and physiology where we could pull something out of the body and the body would completely function the exact same way it would without it. Uh, and yet here we do. And really, they do all of the work. You are constantly, 100% of the time, as the urinary system indicates, making urine. Right now, as we speak, you are urinating. However, does that mean urine is dribbling out of your body? No. No, because the accessory structures, the accessory organs, the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra, their sole function is basically just transportation and storage. Store that urine till you get to a socially appropriate location and time, and then void it from your body. They do not process, they do not modify, they do not absorb or secrete or anything. They're all about storage and transportation. So the kidneys truly are the rock star of the system, the fully functional part. Whereas the urinary tract, as I mentioned, those two ureters, the one bladder and the one urethra, are really just about movement and storage. All right, now, as, uh, as I mentioned, the urinary system, the kidneys make urine, but this is probably one of the worst named organ systems, is the goal, is the important thing that the kidneys do make urine? Does urine somehow serve some vital function uh, for you as a person. I know there are plenty of people, well, not plenty, but there are some people who will wash their face with the first urine of the morning. Some will even drink the first urine or gargle with it, the first urine of the morning. So is that because urine is so vitally important? Yes, I agree, ooh, entirely. But is that really the goal? Is the goal really to make urine? Is urine the important thing? No. No, absolutely not, right? Exactly. The primary function of the kidneys and the urinary system is really about filtering the blood, removing wastes, foreign substances, metabolic wastes like ammonia, urea, which is a byproduct of the breakdown of amino acids, bilirubin, uh, as we know, uh, is from the breakdown of hemoglobin, uh, and the urobilin from the breakdown of the bilirubin, uh, creatinine from muscle metabolism, uric acid from the breakdown of nucleic acids, and so on and so forth. All of these are example of nitrogen-based metabolic wastes that need to be filtered out of the blood. They also play a very important role, as we've kind of hinted at in a lot of systems when we talked, for instance, about the um, mineral corticoids in the endocrine system, the kidneys play a huge role in maintaining the appropriate composition of the blood from an ionic standpoint. Because as we have learned, the composition of the plasma is gonna be the composition of the interstitial fluid, which is gonna affect the interstitial fluid of a cell. So basically the environment of the cell is determined by the composition of the blood plasma. So making sure that that cell functions properly is an important function of the kidney and making sure that the blood plasma and therefore the interstitial fluid has the right ionic imbalances. It isn't just about ions either. We need to control uh, the regulation of blood volume, having the appropriate amount of blood. And as you have more blood in your blood vessels, what does that indirectly affect? The blood pressure? Yeah, blood pressure as well, absolutely. The more blood volume you have, the more blood pressure you have. The less blood volume you have, the less blood pressure you have. So notice blood volume indirectly affects blood pressure, but our kidneys also can directly affect blood pressure, primarily by the release of a hormone-like protein. It is not actually a hormone, but it is a protein that works very much like a, pro like a hormone uh, called renin. And renin directly increases blood pressure. And we'll talk about how that does that when we talk about the regulation. If all of that wasn't enough, 
It's not just about the electrolytes that is in the blood and then for the interstitial fluid, as we have talked about and we'll talk about a lot more in this case, it is also the osmolarity. What is the osmolarity the measure of again? Water. True, it's water, but what's the other part of it? It's water and what? Sodium. Sodium can be some of it, but really osmolarity is about the amount of stuff, solute level, absolutely. It's really about the amount of stuff in the blood. Yes, sodium is one of the big things that's in the blood, but it really doesn't matter what it is. It's all about the stuff. Size doesn't matter. Uh, charge doesn't matter. None of those things matter. And a great way to think about this is if I have two liters of water, and into one of them, I put a, a mole. There you go. There's an old uh, um, chemistry term come back to haunt us. One mole of salt into the liter of water. And I put one mole of sugar into the other liter. Are they going to have the same osmolarity? No. Why not? Sugar is a bigger molecule. True. Sugar is a bigger molecule. So does that mean, let's give them names. Beaker A or beaker B. A is salt. B is sugar. Which one has the higher molarity? Or if you think they're equal, hit other. Come on, a couple more people. There you go, one more person. No, that person apparently is asleep. All right, excellent, we'll stop it there. There you go, notice about two thirds of you, about half of you actually, think it's A and the other half think it's either B or the same. Uh, since A was the majority, let's go ahead. Oh, there. Oh, right. There we go. Now you see, do you guys see it now? Excellent. So someone who said A, tell me why. Why do you think A might have more? Because salt is associated with iron, sodium. Exactly. Remember, osmolarity is a measure of stuff. When you put salt in water, it disassociates into sodium ions and chloride ions. So if I put one salt into water, I get two things. If I put one sugar into the water, it's much, much bigger than sodium and chloride together. Oh, that should be a chloride. That sugar, yes, is much bigger than sodium and chloride when they're together, but it's still just one thing. Osmolarity is the measure of things. So actually that mole of salt would have twice the osmolarity as the mole of sugar. Because while they started out as, you know, 6 to uh, 0.23 towards the 23 power or whatever the heck it is, uh, that ever that uh, av avocado number, um, if we put a thousand of salt in one side and a thousand of sugar in the other, those thousand of salt are going to disassociate into two things. And osmolarity is a measure of stuff. So it's not just about uh, uh, ions. It's also about plasma proteins. It's also about uh, sugars. It's also about all sorts of other things, ATP, all sorts of you know, nucleic acids, things. It's just the number of things. Like we saw in the respiratory system, our respiratory system played an important role in regulating the pH of our blood. How does our kidney regulate the pH of the blood?
What do you think? All right, someone remind me how um, our respiratory system related to the pH of our blood. Uh, depending on how much iron it filters. Okay, well, but so, uh, so that can definitely be one thing, but which ions in particular? HCO minus and I forgot the name, H plus. There you go. Hydrogen ions and HCO3, which was what again? Anybody remember what HCO3 was? Well, it was like two days ago, dudes. Like bicarbonate or something? Yeah, bicarbonate, absolutely. Remember, bicarbonate was a very important buffer we mentioned for our blood. So this bicarbonate is something that our kidney is going to want to hold on to while we can release hydrogen ions. Unless, of course, the blood is too basic, then we can hold on to the hydrogen ions, right, and maybe release some of the bicarbonate. So by controlling the amount of hydrogen and bicarbonate ions that it is holding on to or releasing into the urine, it can help us to maintain blood pH, right? We had that equation. Carbon dioxide plus water equals acid, which does the disassociates in uh, hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. So the respiratory system works on the carbon dioxide side. The kidneys work on the hydrogen ions and bicarbonate side. So both of these are able to control the pH of the blood by controlling those two sides of that same equation. If that wasn't enough, the kidneys are also responsible for producing hormones. We already talked about renin, which is not a hormone, but acts like one. What is a hormone we've talked about in this class that we know the kidney produces? Okay, it plays a role in activating calcitriol, absolutely. Give me another one. Erythropoietin? Yeah, there you go, erythropoietin. Remember, that's the one that uh, allows us to make more red blood cells if the oxygen carrying capacity of our blood is down. So remember, we talked about that was an important function of the kidney, and we'll talk about that again. Uh, lastly, oh, there you go, erythropoietin, calcitriol, absolutely excellent. Lastly, um, especially when you are fasting, right, times like Ramadan or other times when you may be fasting, uh, one of the things that your kidneys are able to do is to help to maintain appropriate blood glucose levels. Uh, and it does that with a process called gluconeogenesis. Gluco, of course, refers to the sugar. Genesis, to give birth to. Neo, new. So basically, uh, what it does is it takes the amino acid, primarily glutamine, and it converts that glutamine into glucose. So in times of fasting or starvation, it can actually help to convert some of your amino acids into glucose to help to maintain glucose levels. So we said the uh, kidney is a rock star, kind of like all oh, the liver did a ton of stuff. The kidney does a ton of stuff as well. It is an incredibly impressive organ, right? Professor, where is glutamine stored? Uh, remember, like most amino acids, it's going to be free floating within our blood plasma so that it can be given to the interstitial fluid so that it can be taken up by the cells that need to use it. So this, this, the same way that there's going to be uh, other proteins and other, you know, uh, carbohydrates and things like that dissolved in the cytoplasm of the, uh, of the cell, it's also going to be in the interstitial fluid. It's also going to be in the blood plasma. You have that cheeseburger for breakfast and some of the proteins from that get broken down into glutamine and they end up in our blood and they're floating around. So most of our amino acids are uh, transport, all of our amino acids are transported by the blood to the cells. And if it's in the blood, it goes to the kidney. All right. Questions on that? 
All right, excellent. All right, so that is the function. We'll come back and talk about all of that in a little bit more detail later and talk about how that works. But like I said, we need to talk about the anatomy. We've already talked about the anatomy a little bit. We know the kidneys and those adrenal glands sitting on top of them are retroperitoneal organs. And someone remind me again what that means? In the back of the peritoneal cavity? Yeah, behind the peritoneal cavity, right? behind the parietal peritoneum that forms the peritoneal cavity. Excellent, excellent. Here, we see that nicely in this cross-section. Notice in this cross-section, here we see uh, that parietal peritoneum lining the abdominal pelvic cavity, and it goes over the top of the kidneys. So the kidneys are behind the peritoneal cavity. Notice they're not just floating around in there. They have their own nice little pockets. As we can see in this space, uh, there is a renal fascia, uh, both a posterior level, uh, pardon me, layer of the renal fascia, which anchors to the posterior wall of the abdominal pelvic cavity. There is an anterior renal fascia which basically sits underneath uh, the uh, parietal peritoneum. And it basically forms a pocket, a space that that kidney sits in. That space, as you can see, is going to be filled with adipose. This adipose or fat capsule that wraps around it helps to cushion and protect and support the kidney in that space inside of that pocket formed by the anterior and the posterior renal fascia. I think we've talked about this before, but I don't recall, at least in 430, I'm pretty sure we did. One of the things when people go on to shows like The Biggest Loser, or when people have stomach stapling or some other type of stomach banding or some other type of uh, extreme weight loss program, uh, the uh, doctors watch their urine output very, very closely. When you lose weight at a healthy rate, uh, your body has time to actively redistribute the adipose. It's something your body does all the time anyway. So as you're losing weight and losing fat, you're able to redistribute it. However, when you're on some of these extreme crash diets, you're losing weight so rapidly that you can lose adipose everywhere. And that's a big concern here with the kidney. Of course, the kidney is connected by the ureter to the bladder. And if we start to massively lose weight, what can actually happen is as we lose that fat capsule, the kidney can actually descend in the, in the abdominal pelvic cavity. It's a condition we call a ptosis. Now, yes, as you can see, it's slightly protected by the ribs. So having it descend makes it in a little bit more of an exposed space, but that's not the big concern. The biggest concern is that when it descends, the ureter, which is carrying the urine to the bladder, can kink. And what happens when you kink a hose? It's stuck. Yeah, two things really happen. One is that the water doesn't flow anymore. So urine wouldn't come out, urine would back up into the kidney. And the other thing that happens when you kink the hose is you build up pressure behind that kink. So now you've got your kidney filling up with urine and increasing the pressure of that urine inside of it. And that can be incredibly dangerous and uh, damaging to the kidney. So when these people are on these extreme weight loss programs, like, like I said, like the biggest loser, uh, they are closely monitoring their urine output to make sure that something severe like this isn't happening. Lastly, when we're thinking in terms of protection, uh, as we've seen many, many times, we have this nice candy wrapper on the outer surface. And so notice we have on the outer surface of the kidney, and we'll take a closer look at this in just a second. We can see that fibrous capsule made up of a dense irregular connective tissue that anchors it to the adipose. 
inside that uh, fascia pocket. All right, questions about that organization or protection? Now, if you look closely at this picture here to the left, we did all that. And then we take a closer look at it here. You will notice that, as I mentioned, the kidneys are mostly protected uh, by the ribs. The ribs partially do protect them. Notice they line up with about T12 through L3 of the uh, vertebrae. However, if you notice, they are not symmetrical. The right kidney is slightly lower than the left. Any idea why that might be the case? Why might your right kidney be lower than the left? Because the left is better. The liver pushes it down. Yeah, exactly. Remember, we have that big, huge, massive visceral organ that is the liver hanging out here in this space with that big, huge right lobe. And that big, huge right lobe pushes the right kidney down causes it to descend slightly more than that tinier spleen does on the left side. Kidney, not surprisingly, has a kidney shape to it, right? We've talked about kidney beans, we've talked about lymph nodes, and of course we know that that means that it has a convex and a concave uh, surface to it. And of course, what do we call that concave surface? the helm, excellent. And much like we saw in the lungs, uh, we, uh, this hilum is also going to be where the blood vessels, where the nerves, uh, and also where the ureter carrying the urine comes out of the kidney. So again, another similarity between the kidneys and the, the respiratory system, which we just talked about. Here, we see lots of great pictures to, uh, showing the anatomy of the kidney. Uh, there is a great model in a, the classroom. It is a, a plaque that has three individual uh, images on it. And one of them is the one that we basically see here. And with this, we can see some of the anatomy. I know normally I draw this stuff myself, but I thought it might be fun to just draw this on the images that we see here. Notice for starters, we have that fibrous capsule, as we've mentioned, that dense irregular connective tissue that is on the outer surface. Then we see that this is arranged in another similar fashion we've seen before, where we have an outer region and an inner region. And when we have this type of organization, what do we call the outer region? The cortex. Cortex, excellent. Oops. And what do we call the inner region? The medulla. Medulla. However, notice there's something interesting about the medulla. The medulla are in these pyramid shapes where they have a nice broad base and then they have an apex that comes out to the top. And because they have this cone shape to them with a big wide base and then that apex that sticks out, they are known as the medullary pyramids. And the average kidney, I think is somewhere between six and 18 or something like that of these. Notice uh, the apex of the kidney actually uh, pokes out into a space. This model doesn't do the best job of showing it, but I will emphasize it over the top. Notice that fibrous capsule continues on into the inside of the kidney. And when it does that, it forms a space inside of this kidney. Now, clearly you can see this space is filled with stuff, but this space is what is known as 
the renal sinus. And notice that the apexes, the tips, or what we would call the papillae, finger-like extension, they stick out into the sinus. Now, as I mentioned, the sinus is indeed the space uh, associated with the hilum. Oops. With the hilum. However, you can see that there is lots of stuff in the space. And that stuff in the space includes as we've talked about blood vessels and nerves. The fat capsule that wraps around the kidney, some of that adipose will also come and fill this space as well. But the other thing that we have in here are tubular structures. That's job it is to collect the urine. What we can see with those, and I'll highlight them here in green. That doesn't show up very well. This one show up better? Yeah, that shows up better. Notice this one and this one and this one that I've drawn right there. All of those are examples of what we would call a minor Calyx, the plural of calyx is calyces. The key to a definition of the minor calyces is that they receive urine from just one papillae. So notice the three I've drawn. This one is getting urine from this papillae, this one from this one, and this one from that one. However, notice these minor papillae will fuse together to form major papillae. And a major papillae would be a tube-like structure uh, that receives I'm sorry, major calyx. For multiple papillae. These major and minor calyces are going to feed I really am wearing the colors. Into this large funnel shaped structure. This large funnel shaped structure is the renal pelvis. And again, we'll think of these definitions in terms of the urine again. And so it receives urine from all the papillae, because again, it's collecting all of it. And the renal pelvis, the funnel, then feeds into the ureter. And it is that ureter which then carries it to the bladder. So we have this whole tube-like structure that is involved with collecting the urine and transporting it out of the kidney. And there's one more important thing to say about all of these structures. So let me cheat and move this down. 
since the job of all of these is going to be to collect the urine and just carry it to the bladder, not process it at all, what type of epithelial tissue do you think lines all of these structures, the minor, the major, the pelvis, and the ureter? Only in 430, I'd learned an epithelial tissue that was only found in the urinary tract. The transitional? Absolutely. Yeah. It is all lined with a transitional epithelium. As is the bladder, as is the ureter, until the very, very distal tip of the urethra. At the very, very distal tip of the urethra, what epithelial tissue do we have there? It's a non-cratinized stratified squamous. There you go, exactly. Right, all the you know external openings to the outside world are all pretty much lined with a stratified squamous epithelial tissue. This one is a mucous membrane, so it's going to be a non-keratinized stratified squamous. But all the rest of the urinary tract, starting here in the minor calyces, they're all lined with transitional epithelial tissue. All righty. Let's take a look at the pretty pictures from your textbook that show the same thing. Here, hold on, before I change the screen, I'll say that because otherwise when I change screens, it'll go away. But this will just reemphasize the things that we've been saying. Here in this simpler illustration, again, we get the nice view of our kidney that we were talking about. Notice again, we have the, don't use pink, that fibrous capsule on the outer surface. And then inside of that, oh, that's what I forgot to say. We have the cortex. We have the pyramids, which are the cone-shaped structures. And notice, as we said, because of that compartmentalization of the pyramids, there are extensions of the cortex that penetrate deep down into the center of our kidney. And these regions are what are known as the renal columns. When you look at the renal cortex under the microscope, you see it has a very granular uh, appearance to it. And that is for two reasons. That is where we find the functional units of the kidney, those nephrons, which are gonna be responsible for filtering uh, the blood. And it is very, very well vascularized. The medullary periods, as I mentioned, somewhere about six to 18 per uh, kidney, uh, are very easy to distinguish because they are typically darker in color like we see here. And like our illustration shows us, they have these striations. The tubes and the blood vessels and the structures of these pyramids all pretty much run parallel from the cortex down towards the apex. So they have a very striped appearance or this grooved appearance to them, uh, which make them very distinct and easy to identify. Notice as we talked about the terminate at that papillae, that finger-like extension, which extends into the renal sinus. And again, they're divided by the columns. When we look at the anatomy of this, and you see it here with the dotted line, I'll just change colors. A pyramid plus the cortex that surrounds it. So that doesn't just mean on the top, but the column that surrounds it as well. That segment of the kidney is what is known as the lobule. And if a kidney has six to 18 pyramids, how many lobules is it gonna have? Six to eight. Six to 18, there you go, exactly.
four lobes. Lastly, as I mentioned here, they do a nice job of showing this sinus, this space in here, the renal sinus. Notice the illustration also does a good job of showing how that uh, fibrous capsule does come and line this inner surface. It also does a nice job of showing how this space will be filled with blood vessels and adipose and uh, nerves, but it also contains these collecting vessels. Again, when we talk about the calluses, the minor calluses are the ones that receive urine from just one papillae. Major calluses receive urine from two or more calluses. And the renal pelvis is the funnel shaped region that receives urine from all the calluses. Which then feeds into the ureter. Questions on this? Here we see what it looks like in a real kidney. Well, this is actually a pig kidney, but I guess that still makes it real. Again, we can see the striped appearance of the pyramids, the lighter, more granular uh, cortex, and some of those columns that are penetrating down. Notice we can see those funnel-like uh, structures. There's our pelvis leading into a major calyx, meeting into a minor calyx, and many of the blood vessels in here as well. Now, we didn't look at them, we didn't see them, but we also know that there is a massive nerve control to this known as uh, the renal plexus. This is primarily made of autonomic nerve fibers and ganglia. And does the kidney receive dual innervation from both the sympathetic and parasympathetic? Well, I'm asking the question, so it's the obvious answer. If it did, would I be asking the question? No. Probably not. So let's think about it. We have our fight and flight sympathetic, and we have our rest and digest parasympathetic. Which of those two seem more likely to be the primary source of nerve input into the kidneys? Parasympathetic? Exactly. The sympathetic fibers. Wait, what? Didn't we just say parasympathetic? Didn't we say parasympathetic was the rest and digest? Yeah, but if you remember way back in 430, we mentioned how uh, in a surprise, the kidneys are primarily innervated only by the sympathetic nervous system. We'll talk about why in a lot more detail on Tuesday, but here's the short version. While you're sitting here at rest, what percentage of your blood is being delivered to your kidneys? 20 to 25. Yeah, about 25%. Absolutely. Excellent. All right. Now, if while you're sitting here calmly, 25% of your blood is being sent to your kidneys, do you think it really needs a go get them from the parasympathetic nervous system to tell your kidneys to do their jobs? No. No, probably not. However, when you're active and you're moving around and you're exercising and you're running downstairs in the break to make a cup of coffee and doing all of those types of things, when you're active, you have blood going more to other parts of the body. When you're at rest, more than enough blood going to the kidneys where the kidneys can easily do their job. However, when you're active, less blood goes to your kidneys. So do you want your, your kidneys to be less effective? 
when you're active? No. No, you don't. So what it happens, our sympathetic nervous system helps it out a little bit so that when you're active, we can compensate for that decreased blood flow and still maintain optimal function of the kidneys. So I know it doesn't seem intuitive, right? Filtering the blood definitely seems like a rest and digest type of process, but it's actually the sympathetic that is needed in this case. And we'll actually, like I said, we'll actually see the mechanism for that on Tuesday. Is that why high stress can damage your kidneys? Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, chronic stress absolutely can have uh, a, an impact on kidney function. Absolutely. Yep, yep. All right, again, it's an offsuit of the celiac plexus. Remember, the celiac plexus is also the one that controls respiration, right? The diaphragm, we talked about that in 430 as well. And again, the goal is to regulate blood flow, to maintain appropriate urine formation. But again, it's really not about making the urine, it's about properly filtering the blood. All righty. The kidney also has an incredibly rich blood supply. Not surprisingly, not only is it innervated, but it has a massive blood supply. As we mentioned, while we're sitting here at rest, about 25% of your blood is being directed uh, to your kidneys. So we want to take the time to draw that pathway, understand that pathway. Now, with this blood, we are filtering 200 liters of stuff out of the blood. And notice that 200 liters of stuff we filter out of the blood, we call filtrate. When it first comes out of the blood, it's not urine. And that's probably a good thing. Do you produce 200 liters of urine during the course of a day? No. No, we'd all be sitting in the bathroom right now if taking this, I mean, taking this class, if that was indeed the case. Plus, do you have 200 liters of extra fluid you can afford to release from your body every day? No. No, absolutely not, right? Think of your Alhambra water bill if that was indeed the case. So while 200 liters come out of the blood vessels in the kidney, over 99% of that is reabsorbed. So during the course of a day, we only produce about one to two liters of urine. So the vast, vast majority of that stuff is absorbed back into the body. This, like I said, not surprisingly, requires a tremendous amount of work. And so we have a very elaborate blood vessel structure that we wanna make sure we understand. Now for this one, rather than using the picture, uh, I'm going to draw this one. So let's get a new board. Let's go ahead and draw a kidney here. And here will be the sinus. And we'll go ahead and put a handful of pyramids in here. Excellent. So let's think of our circulation to the kidney. Where does it start? Come on, let's start in the left ventricle. Where does it go from the left ventricle? Sending aorta. Excellent. To what? The aortic arch. To what? The abdominal aorta. 
Okay, the thoracic uh, aorta to the abdominal aorta. Okay, again, I thought that would be easier and we wouldn't have to write that down, but we'll go ahead and start with the abdominal aorta. Excellent. Where does it go next? Crap, sure wish I had learned the blood vessels in this class at some point. There you go, renal arteries. Excellent, so over here, we have, uh, I'm gonna have to move this closer, an abdominal aorta. And off of that comes the renal artery. Now, it turns out the renal artery doesn't actually enter into the kidney. Instead, the renal artery branches. And it is these branches that enter into the different segments of the kidney. So guess what we call these blood vessels that enter into the kidney to go to the different segments? The segmental arteries. Excellent. A segmental artery. These segmental arteries then branch to form blood vessels that penetrate going into the renal columns between the lobes. So what do you think we call a blood vessel that goes between the lobes? There you go, Amy jumped, got me. Interlobar artery, excellent. These interlobar arteries, when they get to the base of the pyramids, then arc over the base of the pyramids, helping to form the dividing point between the cortex and the medulla. Guess what we call these blood vessels that arc over the uh, base of the, uh, uh, the pyramids? artery. I think I've done singular for all of them, so I'll do singular for this as well. Excellent. Then radiating off of the arcuate artery into the cortex are blood vessels that used to be known as the interlobular arteries, different from interlobar arteries interlobular arteries. And again, if you use that on the exam, that would still be acceptable. But I think because a lot of people found that confusing and because these blood vessels uh, radiate into the cortex, what else are these interlobular arteries known as? Cortical radiate arteries. Excellent. So notice if we continue our pathway, renal arteries feed into segmental, I'm not gonna write artery just for the, the space of it, into the interlobar. Actually I am, I lied. Into the interlobar. into the arcuate, into the cortical radiant artery. 
And from there, it feeds into a blood vessel that feeds into the specialized capillary of that specialized structure known as the nephron. The nephron, as I mentioned, is the functional unit of the kidney. Each kidney has something like a million of these uh, neurons, nephrons in them. And they're the ones that are responsible for producing the filtrate, for filtering the blood. And inside of it is actually not one, but two and a half uh, capillaries. And what do we call a blood vessel that feeds into a capillary? An afferent arteriole. Right, well, we call it an arteriole and this one happens to be feeding into it. So you are 100% correct. That cortical radiant artery feeds into the afferent arterioles. And that afferent arteriole then feeds into the nephron. And so this tiny little blood vessel right here that we drew would be the afferent arteriole. We'll talk about the anatomy of the nephron in a minute. But what we know is that when you feed out of a capillary, you're fed into by an arteriole and you're fed out of into what? What do capillaries feed out into? Venule. Venules. Excellent, oops, need to make that big. Into a venule. Excellent. So coming out of our nephron is a venule. That venule then feeds into veins that radiate down into the border between the cortex and the medulla. What do you think we call these? This should get easier. Well, if the blood vessels that radiate out into the cortex or the cortical radiant arteries or interlobar arteries, guess what these things are called? Cortical medullary arteries? No, nope. cortical radiant. Same thing, cortical radiant veins. Or interlobular veins. They feed into veins that arc over the base of the pyramid. Guess what we call those? Arcoid veins. These arcuate veins feed into veins that travel between the lobes of the uh, pyramids. So what would that be? There we go. Be careful, not Euler, low bar, interlobar. bar. That, again, that's why they got rid of the interlobular and low bar and lobular, I think were too confusing. So these are the interlobar veins, the same way they're the interlobar arteries. Are you not noticing some symmetry here? We have interlobar arteries, we have interlobar veins. We have 
our cuit arteries. We have our cuit veins. We have cortical radian arteries. So we have cortical radiant veins. We have an arteriole, we have a venule, right? Notice we are following the exact same path coming in that we took coming out. So of course, what should be formed next? Segmental veins. Exactly, but what's the other rule we know in anatomy and physiology? Anatomist status. There are no segmental veins. The interlobar veins just come together to form the renal vein. And of course, what does the renal vein feed into? There we go, inferior vena cava, excellent. So that is most of the pathway we need to know for the blood vessels. Certainly that is how the blood gets to the nephron and gets out of the nephron. Any questions on those? And again, notice it's an almost identical pathway in and out. And the names basically tell you exactly what they do. All right, interlobar, go between the lobes. Arcuate, arc over the bases of the pyramids. Cortical radiant, radiate into the cortex. Now, the only thing we need to connect them is to figure out what's going on inside of the nephron. And as I mentioned, inside of the nephron, we have two and a half uh, capillaries. One of the capillaries is a highly, highly specialized capillary known as the glomerulus. many specializations about it, and we'll talk about them, but one of the big specializations about it is it has an arteriole that feeds into it, and it has an arteriole feeding out of it. And if it's the afferent arteriole that feeds into it, what do you think the blood vessel that feeds out of it is? The efferent arteriole? Exactly. The advantage of having a second arteriole is we can feed into a second capillary. This is much more of a traditional type of capillary and it is called the paratubular. Capillary. But I not so subtly pointed out that there can be two and a half capillaries, because sometimes with this paratubular capillary, there may also be a special capillary known as a vasorecta. Not all nephrons have them, but some may have a third capillary known as a vasorecta. And so then either from the paratubular capillary or from the vasorecta, we're going to feed into the venule. And now we can truly trace a blood, a drop of blood from the heart through the kidney and even back to the heart. Because of course the inferior vena cava goes where? Where does the inferior vena cava go? There we go. Excellent, right atrium. Thank you, Ruby. Excellent. So again, I've done a truly amazing job of drawing this, but let's look at the pretty picture from your textbook. 
notice here we see the exact same thing we just did on the whiteboard. Our renal artery comes in and then branches before it enters into the kidney, forming the segmental arteries. Segmental arteries branch to go between the uh, lobes of the kidney, the interlobar arteries. Those branch to go over the base of the medulla pyramid, the arcuate arteries, which go into the cortical radiant. And notice this one doesn't actually have the afferent arterioles that would come off of that cortical radiant artery. It feeds into the nephron. And here we see this a little bit. Notice here, this tiny little structure coming off here represents the afferent arteriole and this ball represents our glomerulus, that first capillary. This doesn't have uh, the uh, efferent arteriole or the paratubular capillaries. And remember, some of these will also have a vasa recta. But, uh, let's get rid of all that. As we saw, the path out is almost identical to the path in. Venules feed into the cortical radiant veins, which feed into the arcuate veins, which feed into the interlobar veins, which should feed into segmental veins, but anatomists hate us. So instead, the interlobars just feed straight into the renal vein. So with the exception of no segmental arteries, notice the pathways are identical. All right, questions on that? Again, this kind of pathway, isn't that just the kind of thing that I like to have as an essay question? Yes, Dr. Slutsky, it is. Sadly, yes. Sadly, this is easy. You only need to know the way in and then you easily can find your way back out. All right, there you go. So that is our blood flow. From here, we need to next talk about the nephron. We have to talk a lot more about this nephron. Uh, there are two key things I will tell you about the nephron right now. Uh, for starters, as I already mentioned, the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. We talked about the kidney makes 200 liters of filtrate and then processes that 200 liters of filtrate during the course of the day. That's what the nephrons do. And the nephron is basically made of two things. Those two things are going to be blood vessels and tubules. And because these are tubules in the kidney, we'll call them renal tubules. So there's gonna be blood vessels and they're gonna be renal tubules. And these are gonna be the structures that make up a nephron. And conveniently enough, there are four blood vessels and there are four tubules. So eight things that make up the nephron. And that is what we will do next. All right. It is 110. I'm going to go get some caffeine and some food. I strongly encourage you to do the same so that you will be a little bit more lively when we come back. Uh, we will restart at uh, that. It makes it 125 and I will start the recording at that point. All right. I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. So, as I mentioned, what we need to spend most of our time talking about is the anatomy of our nephron. Again, this is that structure that is providing the functional uh, unit, the functional actions of the kidney. As I mentioned, 
uh, earlier. Each kidney has over 1 million of these packed inside of them and they are true workhorses. And again, as I mentioned, their job is to not only produce 200 liters of filtrate, but then also to process it. And as I mentioned, they are made up of blood vessels and renal tubules. And of course, if you were to take all those tubules out and lay them end to end, it would hurt a lot. As I mentioned, it's the urinary system. These are what are responsible for forming urine. But as we already talked about, it isn't the urine that we care about. The urine is the waste material we don't need. It is all about processing the blood to maintain optimal healthy conditions inside of our body. Right now, obviously, the bad stuff that's in you or imbalances that are in you are going to be shown in your urine, which, of course, you already knew, because if there's something wrong with you and the doctor is not sure what it is, what's the first thing the doctor has you do? Be in a cup. Be in a cup, exactly, so that they can see what's going on inside of you. Excellent. So, as I mentioned, a nephron is comprised of two types of structures, blood vessels and those renal tubules. Let's take a look. We'll take a look at the pretty picture from your textbook first, but then we'll go to the whiteboard. Here we see the tubular structures. So let's come here to our whiteboard and do some more fun drawing. Again, our goal is to understand the nephron. And to do that, we need to understand that it is comprised of renal tubules, and blood vessels. Now, we know this is going to start, uh, we can draw this over here. <clears throat> this is our cortical. And actually, you know what, let's do it this way. I'll do it in purple to remind us that this is not actually part of the nephron, but this is our cortical radiant artery, which as we know is going to feed into our afferent arteriole. which is also not a part of the uh, nephron. So let's cheat and move this over so I have a little bit room, more room over here to play. All right, the first important structure we need to be able to identify a part of the nephron is a structure called the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle is comprised of three components. One of those components is that specialized capillary we talked about, the glomerulus. So uh, let's do that. One, glomerulus. And we can draw this now in red. It is a highly specialized capillary. And there are a couple important characteristics about it. For starters, the glomerulus is a high pressure capillary. Does anybody remember and way back in uh, the beginning of this class when we talked about arteries and veins, what the typical pressures were at the arterial end and the venous end of a capillary? The arterial end was higher than the venous end. True, absolutely. And do you remember by any chance what the numbers were? Was it uh, 34 and 17? Yep, 35 and 17, absolutely. 35 at the arterial end and 17 at the venous end. Here in the glomerulus, it's actually closer to 55. So it's actually almost double what we expect in a similar capillary. 
However, there are a couple other big differences between our glomerulus and another uh, typical capillary. It is a fenestrated capillary. Someone remind me again what that means? It has like holes within it. Right, so it allows more stuff to filter out of it. And remember, as we saw, because of the changes in pressure, at one end, the capillary was invo involved in secretion and then the other hand in absorption or filtration and absorption, right? In this case, the glomerulus is only outward. So it is only involved in filtration, which is how we make the filtrate. It filters the stuff out of the glomerulus so things only come out. Of this specialized capillary. Now, if all this stuff is going to be leaking out of the capillary, then that means we need something to catch it in. And that thing we're going to catch it in is the second component of the renal corpuscle, Bowman's capsule. Why, of course, is it called Bowman's capsule? Yep, good old Bob Bowman was the first one who discovered it. Uh, so it is also not inappropriate to refer to it as the glomerular capsule uh, as a perfect way of describing it as well. And so let's put that over here as our first renal tubular structure. One of the interesting thing about Bowman's capsule is it is like a serious membrane in that it has both a parietal and a visceral layer. So Bowman's capsule actually continues to help to wrap around and stabilize this very high pressure capillary. Now, the parietal layer is basically just a cup needed to collect the filtrate. So does it need to have a lot of shape or structure to it? No. No. So the parietal layer is just going to be a single, simple squamous epithelial tissue. Excellent. The visceral layer though, are some very specialized cells. And these very specialized cells help to not only support the glomerulus capillary, but also help to play a role in filtering what comes out of them. As such, they have these long little foot-like processes that come off of them. And as such, the visceral layer is made up of these special cells called podocytes. And they help to support and filter. All right. Questions on that? 
Now notice, and I've exaggerated it in this space, in this case, but for that filtrate to come out and be collected in the cup, we have to have some space in the cup. And that is the third component of our renal corpuscle. This renal corpuscle, yeah, the third component of it is called Bowman's space, or of course, glomerular space, but it is a space. Now, remember the nephrons are only found in the cortex. of our kidney. And so not surprisingly, these renal corpuscles, renal corpuscles are only found in the cortex. So if you see a renal corpuscle, that is a dead giveaway. You were looking at the cortex of the kidney. In fact, if you took me for 430, the cortex of the kidney was actually the very first histology slide we ever looked at because we were looking for this simple squamous epithelial tissue that forms the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. All right, questions on that? Excellent. We now have one tubular structure, one blood vessel structure. Let me move this stuff up a little bit. Give me, make sure I have plenty of room for everything I need to do. Excellent. Once we make that filtrate, it needs to be processed. So to process it, we are going to have a very long tubule. Now, of course, your kidneys is you know, a little bit bigger than your two fists together. So these, these long 85 miles of tubules just can't be laid straight here in the cortex. So not surprisingly, they are very twisty and turny. Kind of like the plot of a very ancient show uh, found on television known as Lost. Lost was a show back in ancient times that your grandparents probably watched. And uh, one of the big things about it is that it had an incredibly twisting and turning plot. One could even say that it was convoluted. And since this particular convoluted tubule happens to be the one that is attached to Bowman's capsule, this twisty, turny tubule is known as the proximal convoluted tubule. Oops, this should be two. The proximal convoluted tubule. It's all twisty and turny. This is where most of the processing takes place. And unlike respiration, where the movement of gases was completely passive, do you think the movement of the processing of this filtrate is going to be completely passive? No. Come on, guys, you guys are killing me. I'm, I'm lobbing up softballs here to make it easy for you guys. You have to interact with me. Otherwise, I can go to sleep. This is my Friday. I'm done when I'm done with you guys. So if you like, you can just go watch the YouTube video of the last time I gave this lecture and I can start drinking. So I'm here for you. So please, when at least when I give you the softballs, interact. So active or passive? Active. There you go. Primarily active. So not surprisingly, there are going to be two big specializations to the proximal convoluted tubule epithelial tissue. It is a simple cuboidal epithelial tissue, which is going to have a massive amount 
of mitochondria because that makes the ATP and it is going to have very long microvilli. So on this, we are gonna see some cuboidal cells. I'll just draw a couple of them here. And these cuboidal cells are gonna have massively long, there, we'll make them massively long. Microvilli and a ton of mitochondria. I'll just draw, we'll pretend those are bean shape. Ton of mitochondria in there for all of the processing that is going to take place. Now, after the proximal convoluted tubule, our tubule does something in interesting. It straightens out, forming this long, narrow tube that goes down and straight. And in fact, in some, of the nephrons, it can actually pass the arcuate arteries and veins and can actually uh, penetrate deep into the medulla. Can, doesn't have to, but some of them will actually penetrate deep into the medulla. What is this structure, this long straight structure collectively known as? Is that the nephron loop? Yeah, exactly. This is indeed the nephron loop. Although, a Bob discovered it, so what's the other name for it? Loop of heel? Henley, yeah, absolutely. The loop of Henley. Again, like Bowman's capsule, these terms are so ubiquitous. They're so everywhere. Either way, uh, it is okay to describe them that way. Now, there is an interesting thing about the nephron loop. There is the part of the nephron loop that travels down deep, and then the part that comes back up. And so not surprisingly, we give two different names to these two different parts. There is the descending limb. Actually, let's do it over here. We'll do it here first. And so of course, what does that make the other side? Ascending limb. The ascending limb, excellent. Excellent. But there's another big difference about them as well. There's a difference functionally, but there's also a difference structurally. It turns out that the thin limb is actually comprised of simple squamous epithelial cells. So our descending limb is also known as the thin limb. And the ascending is actually made up of simple cuboidal cells. So it is known as the thick limb. So for our nephron loop, we have a thin descending limb. that is thin because it is made of simple squamous epithelial tissue. Oops, too big. And a thick descending, uh, ascending limb that is made up of simple cuboidal. Now, this is similar to the simple cuboidal we saw in the proximal convoluted tubule, but it has 
smaller microvilli and fewer mitochondria. As I mentioned, most of the processing takes place in the proximal convoluted tubule. So our nephron is really about controlling uh, blood volume and osmolarity, making sure we have the right amount of uh, blood and therefore the right pressure and also the right amount of stuff in it as well. From here, it continues into another twisty and turning compartment. This twisty turny part is further from the nephron, uh, pardon me, further from the renal corpuscle. And so of course, what is it called? Distal convolute to do. There you go. This is gonna be where the fine tuning takes place. And much of that fine tuning is gonna be driven by our hormones. Remember we talked about all those hormones that tell kidneys to hold on to glucose or to get rid of calcium or to hold on to sodium. All of those hormones, that's where they're communicating. They're talking to the distal convoluted tubule where the fine tuning is located. And basically the anatomy of this is similar to the ascending limb where it is simple cuboidal uh, and it has few microvilli and few, um, fewer mitochondria. So much more similar to what we saw. Dupe, 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 dupe. And we see the same thing here too. I'll just draw one of them. The end. That is the four structures that make up the nephron. However, and I'll need another color now. The distal convoluted tubule feeds into uh, oops. this. Let's sneak it in down there. The distal convoluted tubule feeds our filtrate. a structure called the collecting ducts. The collecting ducts are not a part of the nephron. But they still can process the um, filtrate. In fact, uh, as we'll see, this is also simple uh, cuboidal cells. And there are actually two types. Principal cells and intercalated cells. And so they can still uh, process the filtrate. However, these are the ones that then express out the papillae. So as the filtrate leaves the collecting duct in out the papillae into the minor calyx, that is finally when it is expressed out, when it becomes the urine. And for consistency, let's draw a couple of those cuboidal cells and we'll name them A and B to remind you that there are two types principle and intercalated. And we'll talk about all of this stuff in more detail here.
So just as the afferent arteriole is not part of the nephron, the collecting duct is not part of the nephron as well. All right. Questions on the tubular structures? Yeah, I had a question. Um, yes. For the uh, descending limb, I was just curious why it's made of simple squamous tissue instead of um, cuboidal, simple cuboidal. Uh, as we will talk about when we get to it, so I'm going to give you the short version of this here. The descending limb and the ascending limb serve different functions. Uh, the descending limb is actually about drawing the water out. So that's where we control the water content, whereas on the ascending limb is where we control the solutes. Right. One of the things that we've talked about in pretty much everything we've discussed up to this point in a period of time is wherever salt goes, water follows. Right. We have this uh, uh, that water always follows where the salt goes. What's really cool about the loop of Henley is that it's able to couple those. It can actually move water separate from the solutes. And because it can move those two things separately, it allows us to control the volume and to control the osmolarity. Because otherwise, if we moved out, if we tried to change the osmolarity by pumping out salt, water would follow because that's what water does. But here we can pull it apart. Got it. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, just for clarification, reabsorption would stop when it leaves the collecting duct. After it leaves the collecting duct, that is where no more processing will take place. So when it leaves the collecting duct, out the papillae into the minor calyx, that is when all processing stops, both filtration and reabsorption. Excellent. Did I answer both of your questions? Yeah. Okay, excellent. All right. So what we're left with is some more blood vessel structures. Now, one of these we've already talked about. We know that coming out of oops, that glomerulus is going to be, oops, no, I want that to be bigger. Another blood vessel. And if it's the afferent arteriole that feeds into the glomerulus, then it feeds out into what? The efferent arterial. Exactly. And again, it's an arteriole. It's a passageway. It's a conduit. So as we know, it doesn't process. It doesn't filter. It doesn't do anything. All our efferent arterial does. basically just carries the blood out of the glomerulus. And like all arterioles, it feeds it into a capillary. And in this case, the capillary it is going to feed the blood into is what is known as the peritubular. And with a name like paratubular capillary, guess where it's located? Well, what does peri mean? Around. Around. So if it's the peritubular capillary, guess where it's found? Around the tubule. There you go. It's a capillary that is a big capillary bed that is going to wrap around the tubules. Right? After all, if we are processing things into and out of the tubule, it has to go into and out of something, and that's going to be the blood vessels. So notice this paratubular capillary wraps around the tubules. And it is a more typical capillary. It is lower pressure. It 
moves substances in both directions. So either out of the blood into the filtrate where it'd be leaving or into, out of or into oops, the blood. So it's gonna move in both directions. And also like a typical capillary, it feeds into a venule. So again, coming out of this, is gonna be a vein, which is gonna venule, which feeds into the cortical radiant vein, which feeds into the arcuate vein and so on and so forth. So, cortical radiant vein. And venule. All right. But some nephrons, specifically the ones that have a very long nephron loop, which of course we're going to have a fancy name for because anatomists hate us but those with a very long nephron loop will have a special capillary around the nephron loop. And that special capillary around the nephron loop is our fourth blood vessel structure known as the vasa recta. It also has a special shape. It tends to have kind of a draping or even a ladder-like appearance. So let's go ahead and draw this. We'll do it in pink. So again, it will kind of travel along the uh, nephron loop and then it kind of has this kind of draping appearance over it, so it kind of looks like a ladder, like drapes, and the way it drapes down over the top of it. And these play a huge role in concentrating the urine. Right? If you are well hydrated, if you are taking good care of yourself, then typically you produce a large volume of dilute urine but if you've only had three glasses of water over the past two days, do you want to be releasing a large amount of water from your body? No. No, and so typically what ends up happening is you draw back more and more of the water, your volume of urine gets smaller and smaller. It has the same amount of stuff in it, so it becomes very concentrated. So it produces a very small volume of very concentrated urine. And these vasorectas play a huge role in this. And there you go. Just that simply with this incredibly beautiful illustration that I've done. Whoa, didn't mean to do that. Um, we see exactly what this nephron looks like. Okay, maybe not, but we've done a simple, simple illustration of it. Let's go to the pretty pictures from your textbook now and see what this looks like. Notice here, we see the tubular components. Notice it starts as we mentioned with our glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule, wrapping around that glomerulus. Notice the parietal layer is going to be those simple squamous cells because it's just a cup for catching filtrate. But wrapped around the uh, glomerulus itself is that visceral layer with those special podocyte cells. And now you can see why it gets the name podocyte. It has a centrally located belly and then all these feet-like extensions that come off of it.
This feeds into our proximal convoluted tubule. Notice simple cuboidal cells with a massive number of mitochondria and many, many microvilli. This is where the majority of the processing takes place. Notice this particular nephron has a, uh, a loop of Henle or a nephron loop that goes into the cortex, I mean, into the medulla. Of course, how can we tell that it's going into the medulla? Because we see those arcuate arteries and veins forming the boundary. And notice there is the thin descending limb made of simple squamous cells and the thick ascending limb coming up that has cuboidal cells with fewer mitochondria and fewer uh, microvilli. And remember that anatomy continues up into the distal convoluted tubules, basically the uh, ascending limb and the distal convoluted tubules look the same. Cuboidal cells, fewer microvilli, fewer mitochondria. That is it for the nephron, but remember we are also going to feed into those collecting ducts where some processing takes place. They also are cuboidal cells. And as I mentioned, they have two different types of cells, principal cells and intercalated cells. And like I said, we'll talk about their functions when we get to those. So those are the four tubular structures that make up the nephron and then the plus one tubular structure that carries the filtrate out of the kidney and then ultimately releases it forming urine. Questions on this? All right. Oops. But remember the nephron isn't just about tubules. There's also a blood supply, two and a half, three capillaries that are gonna make it up. The first one, the specialized one is the glomerulus. Remember it forms part of the renal corpuscle. And here is that beautiful histology picture uh, that we saw way back in 430. This entire structure that we see here, that's horrible. This entire structure right here is the renal corpuscle. This structure is a dead giveaway that you are in the, in the cortex of the kidney because there's nothing else that looks like this. So this renal corpuscle is unique. As we can see, it is made up of three distinct components. We have our simple squamous cells forming the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule that we can see. Obviously my highlighter is thicker than the single uh, layer of cells that are there, but we get the sense of it. Then there's this big globby thing in the center. Notice with the big globby thing in the center, we can see some of the capillaries and some of the blood that's inside them. But notice there are all these nuclei that we're seeing on it. These nuclei that we see on it, on the surface, are those podocytes, that visceral layer of Bowman's capsule that's laid over the top of it, supporting it and protecting it, right? We can clearly see where there's gaps in it, where we can see the blood vessels, but most of what we see are those nuclei of the podocytes. And remember, there is a third component, and that third component is the space in between that Bowman space or glomerular space. Or notice they even call it capsule space. I would accept that as well. Remember, this glomerulus is a high pressure fenestrated capillary that only moves material in one way, out. All it does is filter the blood, making filtrate. From there, it feeds into our second blood vessel structure, 
the efferent arteriole, which again, just carries blood out of the glomerulus and into our second capillary. Here we see that second capillary is a paratubular capillary that wraps around the tubules. This is a typical capillary, low pressure. Materials move in both direction, both in and out of it. It is a uh, continuous capillary, not fenestrated like the glomerulus. And notice it feeds into a venule that feeds into the cortical radiant vein. However, as we also mentioned, some nephrons like this one here have incredibly long loops of Henle. And these with the incredible long loop of Henle, we have this specialized capillary associated with this long loop of Henle. Notice it's not all twisty and turny like the paratubular. It's much more drape-like in its appearance, traveling down and back up ladder-like or drape-like in its appearance, and that is the vasa recta. Now, there is one important point I want to make about this illustration. Notice as we look at the illustration, one capillary has, one capillary has a paratubular capillary, the other has a vasa recta. Is that how it's gonna be? You either have one or the other? No. No. For small nephrons, some of this paratubular capillary can come and wrap around the loop of Henle. It's just not going to have the fancy shape of the vasa recta. And these special nephrons with the long loop of Henle and the vasa recta, they can still have paratubular capillaries. The only reason your textbook separated these is because it wanted to emphasize which are which. It's not one or the other you can easily have both. And so again, I like this picture a lot. I think it does a beautiful job of showing it. But remember, they're just emphasizing there's a regular type and there's a special type of capillary. But it's not one or the other. All right. Those are the components that make our nephrons. I love this picture from your textbook, probably because they look like brains and you know I'm a neuroanatomist, but as you can see very, very nicely from this electron microscopy view, this is a great view of the blood supply. Again, it can be a little scary when you first look at this, but as you look more closely, you can make out the components. Clearly the biggest blood vessel are the cortical radiant arteries. Notice these cortical radiant arteries, and here's probably the best example. Here we have a cortical radiant artery, and not surprisingly, this is the one that's labeled, feeds into an afferent arteriole into this tightly packed, kind of brain looking capillary. Why is this one so tightly packed? Because this is the one that's kept inside of the Bowman's capsule. So these tightly packed capillaries are the glomeruli. Of course, then feeding out of the glomerulus is the efferent arteriole that feeds into these very loose capillaries. Why are these capillaries so big and loose? Well, because they're wrapped around all the tubules. So notice we can clearly see the difference on this electron microscopy between the glomerular capillary and the paratubular capillary. And where's the vasa recta? Shouldn't I see one of those? Wouldn't it be more deep? Yeah, exactly. Remember, if I'm seeing the glomerulus, I am in the cortex. And the vasa rectas are only going to be down in the medulla. So you are 100% correct. The fact that we see glomeruli tell me that we are in the cortex and you're not going to see the vasa recta in the cortex. You're going to only see them in the uh, medulla. Excellent. Lastly, let's slap a name on these two types of nephrons. 
The most common type of nephron is the cortical nephron. It is the one with the short loop of Henle. Notice it's a loop of Henle can go into the medulla, but it doesn't go very deep. But there are also gonna be plenty of nephrons whose loops of Henle will be entirely in the cortex. They'll be entirely contained within the cortex. However, the ones with the long loop of Henle that go deep into the medulla are always gonna be found at the border traveling from the cortex to the medulla, and that's where they get their name. They're the juxtamedullary nephron. Juxtapose means to be on top of. So these are on top of the medulla and penetrate deep into the medulla. So again, it's one of those big alphabet soup terms you're gonna have to learn. And just for numbers, about 85% are cortical, and about 15% are juxtamedullary. And again, do you necessarily need to know that? No. No, right? It's important to know that the majority of them are cortex and that there are just a few specialized juxtamedullary nephrons. Now, oh, and there you go, I did that here. There's a couple other ways that we can see these as well. Let's go back to this picture where we were looking at that plaque that we talked about in the classroom. And as I mentioned, it is a tri-plaque. It has three different models on it. This is the gross anatomy view of the kidney. But notice here, it has a portion of a lobe. Notice we can clearly see the arcuate arteries and veins. So we know this down here is the medulla and this up here is the cortex. So let's do this. Identify the vessel. Here, put it there to make it even more obvious. Identify the vessel. Cortical radiate artery. Excellent. Identify the vessel. Afferent. Afferent arterial. Excellent. Identify the vessel. Glomulars. Excellent. Identify the vessel. Efferent arterial. Excellent. Identify the vessel. Paratubular capillary. Identify the vessel. What do you think that is? Is that the vasa recta? Yeah, that's the vasa recta, exactly. Right, it would be, notice they didn't put it on the loop of Henley, but they put it basically in the same area. Here we just see the arteries. Here we see the arteries and the veins. So that would be that. Excellent. Identify the structure. Bowman's capsule. I like that. Absolutely. Now, notice instead, what if I put like a circle around this and ask you to identify the entire structure? inside of that circle. What do you think that is? Uh, renal corpuscle. Excellent. And what are the three components of this entire structure? Glomerulus, Bowman's capsule, and then the Bowman space. Excellent, perfect. Uh, identify the structure. Proximal convoluted tubule. Identify the structure. Be very specific. The descending limb of, of the loop of Henley. And you get partial credit for that. What'd you miss? Thin. Thin, there you go. Descending thin limb of the loop of Henley or of the nephron loop, right? Versus 
identify this structure, be very specific. Ascending thick limb of the loop of Henry. Perfect, which feeds into this structure. The distal convoluted tubule. Which feeds into this structure. The collecting duct. There you go. See how simple all that was? And as I mentioned, this model has one more picture, uh, one more uh, plaque. This plaque has one more model on it. Our renal corpuscle. Identify the structure, be specific. Or layer, identify the layer, be specific. The parietal layer. Yep, of Bowman's capsule, excellent. Whereas, identify this layer, be specific. The visceral layer? Of Bowman's capsule or of glomerular capsule. Identify the cell. Podocytes, excellent. Identify the vessel. Glomerulus, excellent. Any idea where that dark spot is? Uh, if on the exam, if I were to ask this question, I, I don't think I would, but and there might be a better way to ask that, but uh, let's say it this way. Identify that space. What space do you think that is? Is that the fenestration? Yeah. Notice those dark spots are supposed to represent the fenestrations, the holes in that fenestrated capillary. Absolutely. Now, this is not a fair question yet because we haven't talked about it, but notice there are two vessels here, one with a black arrow and one with a green arrow. No, green doesn't show up well. One with a blue arrow. Obviously, one of those is feeding into the glomerulus. One of those is feeding out of the glomerulus. So one of them must be the afferent arteriole, and one of us must be the efferent arteriole. And does anybody know which is which? It's okay if you haven't yet. I was just curious if anybody's looked ahead at this material. Is this Sorry, go ahead. No, it's fine. You go ahead. Is the black arrow the afferent? Exactly. The afferent ar arterial is more specialized with some specialized cells on it, which is what they're representing. These things are some specialized cells that we'll talk about uh, on the afferent arterial. So yes, typically it's larger, it's thicker, it has more specialized cells on it. So this is indeed the afferent. And then this one up here would be the efferent feeding into the paratubular capillaries which I guess would be the other kind of giveaway. The fact that this is splitting, probably going into, but that's pretty subtle. The difference in size and the difference of cells is the obvious difference. Would blood pressure be higher in the afferent end uh, yes. rather than the efferent? Okay. Absolutely, yep, yes. So my reasoning was that um, it looked like the smooth muscle bands. I was thinking maybe they expand more because the pressure is higher. Yeah, higher pressure, you might want more muscle. And, and in fact, yeah, these, these are specialized muscle cells. They're a combination muscle cell and endocrine cell. So they're a smooth muscle that can control the pressure, but they also release hormones. All right, two more fun things I can do on this one. Identify the space. Bowman space? Yeah. Identify the structure. proximal convoluted tubule, like the beginning yeah, of it? Exactly. That'd be the very beginning of the proximal convoluted tubule, remember? That's what our glomerulus feeds into. And if you look closely, I know it's a little out of focus, but if you look closely, you can actually see they've made the surface of these cells fuzzy to represent the microvilli that are on their surface. 
This is a really great model. We actually have uh, two versions, two different years. So they're slightly, slightly different, but they both show the same views, this up close of the renal corpuscle, the lobule and the entire kidney. And it is a great model. And I've shown them to you, but I guarantee they'll be on the exam. There's one other way we can see this stuff. And that is of course, histologically. Uh, luckily, on your modules, I've given you this. These were just some quick pictures that I had downloaded uh, and found a, uh, a year or two ago when we were looking at this. Uh, this one here does a nice job of showing us that border between the cortex. And even notice, even at a low magnification, we can clearly see those renal corpuscles, which is a dead giveaway that we are looking at the cortex. Whereas notice from here down, there are no renal corpuscles. The medulla has no nephrons. And notice also, whereas here we have tubules going in all sorts of different directions, notice the cross section here, I mean, the cut here of the medulla, all of these, practically every single one of these is in cross section. Because remember, our medulla has stripes because all of the tubules line up. Now, this is a very small uh, magnification view. And again, it's just to show that there's some gross anatomy things we can see. Um, let's start here and we'll come back to this. This shows us some more things than I don't want to talk about yet, but we will get to. What I wanna show you here now is that histologically, notice, They've got some P's in here and they've got some D's in here. Any idea what the P's and D's are? That these are ducts. Not a bad guess. What is the nephron made up of primarily? tubules and blood vessels. And the two types of blood uh, tubules that we would see in the cortex are proximal convoluted tubules and distal convoluted tubules. Notice they've been able to easily identify which ones are proximal and which ones are distal. And you can do that as well. Remember the two things, they're both simple cuboidal, but they're two big differences. Proximal have a lot of mitochondria, distal have very few mitochondria. And is that something we're gonna easily be able to see at this level of magnification? No. no. To see mitochondria, we need to look at an electron microscope. But remember the second thing, proximal convoluted tube, you'll have more and longer microvilli. And notice because they're, microvilli are longer and there's more of them, the lumen of the proximal convoluted tubule looks very dirty. It looks very congested. We can see that fuzziness inside from all those microvilli. Whereas notice in the distal convoluted tubule, its lumen is very clear. Here's another one right here. Those clear lumens indicate that they have fewer microvilla. So how clean or how dirty the lumen is tells you whether you are looking at a proximal or a distal convoluted tube. Now notice there's one more picture on here as well. We've been so focused on the cortex, we haven't looked too much at the medulla. And not surprisingly, it's because there's not a whole lot going on in the medulla. The medulla has, if you think about it, the medulla is made up of three things. Collecting ducts, carrying your uh, filtrate down to the apex, whoops, no. Down to the apex to be released as urine. It also has thin descending limbs of Henle. And it has thick 
ascending limbs of, of, of Henley, loops of Henley or nephron loops. All of the tubules pretty much run parallel. Now, under the microscope, am I gonna make you try to tell the difference between a collecting duct and a thin descending limb or a thick ascending limb? No. No. But if you do notice, there is something interesting about this. If you look in here, you notice that there are some areas where there's this dark reddish stripe within this region. Any idea what that might be? Come on, this is the softball of softballs. It's a recta. There you go, exactly, it's the vasa recta. So notice we can actually see those capillaries. Let's just do those capillaries within the uh, medulla. Notice it's clearly the medulla. There is not a, uh, a renal corpuscle anywhere in sight and all of the tubules are practically all parallel. Dead giveaway, we are looking at the medulla and these long dark stripe regions are the blood in those blood vessels that are draping over the nephron loops. So those vasorectas are something that is also very easy to see when we look at this under the microscope. So you'll notice those are the things, I think I've hit everything on your histology list that you're responsible for, except for the macula densa cells. And we'll talk about that more uh, in a bit. All right. So we've seen this with the pretty illustrations. We have seen this uh, with the models. We have seen this with the histology. And this picture I like a little bit better. Notice here we have a cortical nephron and notice it's paratubular capillary can go over the loop of Henle. The same way that when you have a juxtamedullary nephron that has a vasa recta, it can still have a paratubular capillary as well. So this one's not from your textbook, but this one does a really nice job of showing, again, a more realistic uh, relationship of the tubules and the blood vessels. All right, uh, where are we on time? Uh, this is probably a good stopping point. We still need to have a little bit of review to do. Hold on, let me see where we're at. Yeah, we don't have that much more, but uh, it does get a little bit more dense as we move forward. So I think this is a good stopping point. So let's go ahead and take our next break. So let's come on, bring this back up for a second. Do, 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 do. All right. Any questions on this before we take our next break? All right. Excellent. Because again, if it doesn't make sense now, it's just going to get worse. So uh, we have a little bit more layers to add. It looks like it's 2.30. Let's go ahead and take a 15-minute break. Come back at 2.45. And at 2.45, we will restart. And when we restart, I will start the recording. All right. I will see you guys in 15 minutes. So we've been working our way through uh, reviewing the anatomy that we have talked about. We've looked at the nephrons and their components. And again, we also took a closer look on the model and histologically uh, at the um, renal corpuscle. Here we see those structures. Again, notice even in the simple illustration, the afferent arteriole is larger than the efferent coming out. It's an easy way to tell them apart. Uh, notice here, the majority of the glomerulus is covered with these podocytes that have these foot-like processes that come out that form the tiny little spaces in between them that are the filtration slits. And notice here at the end, they've uncovered a little bit to remind us that these podocytes are sitting on top of a fenestrated capillary. Again, we see the podocytes forming the visceral layer of Bowman's capsule where simple squamous form the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. 
And as we also talked about, it feeds into the proximal convoluted tubule. But there's one other thing that's been on the illustrations. Oh, and uh, here, I know these podocytes look really funny, but here is actually a uh, electron microscopy view. And this really is what these podocytes look like. They have a big centrally located cell body, lots of little feet-like processes that come off, and then those little filtration slits in between them. They form our filtration membrane which as we can see here is comprised of three components. We have the fenestrated endothelium of the capillary, a simple squamous epithelial tissue. We have those specialized foot-like processes of the podocytes, and then a little bit of a basement membrane holding those two things together. So basically water and anything that is small enough can filter through these cracks, leave the blood, which would be over here and form the filtrate that would be collected in the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. Now, the one thing that our illustration and even my illustration showed if we jump back to that really silly picture, notice, I kind of cheated a little bit, but the very end of our distal convoluted tubule actually comes back to the renal corpuscle. And in particular, it's going to do it over here. Or actually, let's cheat since I can move that. More like over here, next to the afferent arteriole. The same way we had some intrinsic control of the lungs. Because after all, the amount of air going into every single alveolus when you have 300 million is not going to be the same. And it's the same thing if you have a million nephrons in your kidney. Not every single nephron is going to receive the exact same amount of blood and is going to be making the exact same amount of filtrate. So each of these need to have their own auto-regulatory process. And they need some specialized cells to do that. And basically, these cells form what we could call our quality control. All right? Probably my favorite example of quality control happens just down the street from us here, uh, down by Fairfield at, um, uh, oh, I spelled quality wrong, at Jelly Belly, at the Jelly Belly factory. In the Jelly Belly factory, they take the little jelly beans, they put them in the machine, all the magic happens, and they become shiny little beans. And then someone or some machine is then responsible for checking the beans as they go by to make sure that they look right and they look pretty. And the ones that don't look right or look pretty or when two of them are fused together, what do they do to those? They sell them as belly flops. Exactly, they pull them out so that they're not part of the pretty uniform ones that they sell. And you're right, they chunk them together in a bag and sell them as belly flops, right? They still taste the same, no sense in wasting them, but you have that quality control. And it's the same thing here. We want to make sure that we're processing the filtrate at an appropriate rate. Let's take it back to the range of Jelly Belly. If that, uh, that conveyor belt of uh, jelly beans is going by too fast. Is that gonna be a problem if you're trying to do quality control? Yeah, you might miss some that were big mistakes that need to be pulled out. So notice if we go too fast, just like those jelly beans, if they went too fast, the problem is going to be, it will be under-processed. If on the other hand, you have two minutes 
per jelly bean to inspect it, what's going to happen in that case? Well, aside from the fact that you're not going to get very many jelly beans in the bag at the end, but if you have the time to really, really criticize every single jelly bean, right? You might overprocess it. One that has maybe just the tiniest of blips in its sugar coating on the top, you're going to go, oh, that doesn't belong, and you're going to pull it out. And so if the filtrate goes too slow, it's going to be overprocessed. So the job of these special regulatory cells are to look at the filtrate, check the filtrate to see is it being overprocessed, is it being uh, uh, is it being overprocessed, underprocessed, or are we processing it just right? Because if it's being over or underprocessed, we need to adjust the system. All right. Let's take it a step further. If the filtrate is going too fast and it's being underprocessed, what do we have to do? Slow it down. Yeah. And the primary way we slow it down in this case is we make less filtrate. You make less filtrate, that slows the process down. So therefore, if it's going too slow, if we're over processing it, what do we have to do? Speed things up. And how are we going to do that? Increase the amount of filtrate. Yeah. All right. With me so far? All right, excellent. Then let's talk about how we do this. Now let's actually just look at the picture. I was decide, debating whether or not I wanted to draw it. All right. These Three types of specialized regulatory cells are all associated with the renal corpuscle. Their job is to help filter and monitor, and they collectively form a structure, I'm not sure what's going on here, known as the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So notice here is our renal corpuscle, Bowman's capsule, afferent arteriole, and the efferent arteriole. Now, as I mentioned, if you're going to have a quality control, do you check the condition of those jelly beans at the beginning of the process or near the end of the process? Near the end? Exactly. And so notice here, near the end, there is a little piece of the distal convoluted tubule that comes right back up to the glomerulus and to where the afferent arteriole is. And that's what we're seeing here. This structure here is the distal convoluted tubule. Now, as we know, it is made up of cuboidal cells. However, notice in this portion of the distal convoluted tubule, there is a small pack of very tightly compact columnar cells. So there are some small amount of smashed together, tightly packed columnar cells. This small pack of columnar cells are what are known as the macula densa. These macula densa cells, again, are in the, I know it says here the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, but it's really the distal convoluted tubule. These macula denda cells have chemoreceptors and osmoreceptors. 
and their job is to check the condition of the filtrate to see if it's been over-processed or under-processed. Now, you know what? We don't have enough room on here. I am going to actually draw this. All right, there's Bowman's capsule. Here's the glomerulus. Here's the afferent. Arteriole. And right here, right next to the afferent arteriole is a chunk of our distal convoluted tubule. It is made up primarily of cuboidal cells. But right here, it has these tightly packed columnar cells. And we'll color them to make them stand out a little bit more. And these are our macula densa cells. So again, in, in the distal convoluted tubule, tightly packed, in our cells called the macula densa cells. These are chemo and osmoreceptors. And they're checking the condition of the filtrate to see if we were over or under processing. Now, let's think about the problem again. As we mentioned, if we are over processing, Was that because we weren't making enough or we made too much? What's the problem if we are over processing the filtrate? We're not making enough. And if we're not making enough, we need to make more. So what happens is our macula densa cells release more nitric oxide. And when they release this nitric oxide, what this does, as we know, is it causes a dilation of smooth muscle cells. But not just any smooth muscle cells, there are these very special smooth muscle cells here on the afferent arteriole. Remember our afferent arteriole was thicker, had this bigger muscular band to it. And so our second cells, type one, uh, hold on. So our first cells were these macula densa cells.
Our second cells are the specialized cells of the afferent arteriole. These are combination of smooth muscle cells and, as I mentioned, endocrine cells. And these are called two things. Juxtaglomerular cells, which once you've written that out once on the exam, you can abbreviate that JG cells. Or because these are smooth muscle cells that have vesicles that can release uh, hormones, they also are, have a granular appearance and are known as granular cells. Both of those would be acceptable terms for them. So being smooth muscle, they can change the diameter of the afferent arteriole and they can release proteins and hormones to affect the body systemically. These are the cells that release erythropoietin. These are the cells that activate calcitriol. These are the cells that release renin which we talked about is gonna to help to maintain blood pressure. Now, let's go back to our solution. Our macula densa cells have released nitric oxide. And as we talked about, nitric oxide is going to cause, whoops, hold on, I want that to stay big. Nitric oxide is going to cause my smooth muscle cells of the afferent arteriole We dilate. And when our afferent arteriole dilates, what happens to the amount of blood entering into the glomerulus? More blood enters. And if there's more blood in the glomerulus, there's more volume, there's more pressure, more filtrate is gonna be produced. And wasn't that our goal? To increase the production of filtrate? Yes. Yeah, absolutely, mission accomplished. However, we don't have to just rely on the afferent arteriole because while these macula densa cells they stimulate the juxtaglomerular cells, the granular cells. They also stimulate a second type of cells. These second type of cells are what are known as mesangeal cells. These are not muscle cells, but they contain a lot of actin. And make a point of emphasizing that these are not muscle cells because I know actin was one of those really important uh, contractile proteins that we used when we talk, learned how a muscle would contract. But if you remember way back to 430 when we talked about the cytoskeleton, remember actin is a very simple um, protein, it's a dimer that can be wrapped to globular proteins that can be rapidly put together into strands. And so the other thing that we said actin does is it'll actin causes dynamic movements of cells. And in particular, in this case of the mesangeal cells, it can build up lots of actin and when it does that, the cell swells and gets bigger. Or it can break down actin. And when we break down actin, the cell gets smaller. All right, with me so far, that makes sense? 
So let's talk about where these cells are located. No, I want that to stay black. These mesangeal cells are basically located here in between the coils of our glomerulus. So basically the loops of the glomerulus sit on top of a mesangeal cell. So let's think about what happens. When a mesangeal cell expands its actin and grows, it pushes the capillaries of the glomerulus out. And when it pushes the capillaries of the glomerulus out, what happens to the surface area of my capillary? It grows. Yeah. And when I collapse the cells and the capillaries fold, fold in on themselves, what happens to their surface area then? Decreases. Exactly. So the mesangeal cells expand, they increase the surface area of the glomerulus. When the mesangeal cells collapse, they shrink down. Well, let's say shrink, I don't like collapse. Collapse sounds bad. Excellent. So in this case, when we want to increase the amount of filtrate, what kind of effect do you think that nitric oxide, that chemical signal from the, mes uh, from the macula densa cells is going to have on my mesangeal cells? It's gonna make the mesangeal cells expand. And when they expand, that increases surface area. And when we have an increased surface area, we make more filtrate. So notice we get more blood going into the glomerulus and we expand the glomerulus. And the net effect is we're going to make more filtrate, which is what we wanted to do. And just to make sure we understand it, let's quickly up here at the top, we'll do it small, do the opposite. What if we are under processing the filtrate? What's gonna happen to the macula densa cells? release less nitric oxide? Exactly. When they release less nitric oxide, what happens to our, to our uh, granular cells? They're going to constrict. Constrict. Less blood into glomerulus. Excellent. What happens to the mesangeal cells? They're gonna shrink. Shrink, and that decreases the surface area. And now we have less blood, we have less surface area, so we make less filtrate. And just that easily, we've brought things back into balance. And so these three cells work together in each individual nephron, 
each nephron has its own quality control to make sure that each nephron is working at the appropriate rate. And this way, all 2 million, 1 million in each kidney, each nephron, each one of those 2 million nephrons can make and process the filtrate at the appropriate rate. Now, again, I appreciate this isn't the best drawing, but I wanted to have room to write. So notice here, we see this same structure, that juxtaglomerular apparatus. And as we talked about, it has three components to it. It has those tightly packed columnar cells in our distal convoluted tubule, known as the macula densa cells. These are the quality controls. They have the chemo and osmo receptor because inside here, in the distal convoluted tubule, we have oh, what essentially we can call almost urine. Right? It's still being processed in the distal convoluted tubule, and it can still be processed in the collecting duct. So we're not fully done yet, but it's almost urine. So it's a good time to check to see how our processing is going. And these cells release nitric oxide. That nitric oxide is going to affect those granular cells. Remember, let's cheat. Now that we go back to this picture when we looked at the renal corpuscle before, now these funny looking cells around the afferent arteriole we can give a name to. Those are the granular cells or juxtaglomerular cells. Either of those are acceptable. And notice they've even given us some of those simple columnar cells of our macula densa right next to it. What is this model missing though? Well, what's the third uh, cell? cells. Yeah, notice in these spaces, in this balled up space inside of the glomerulus, in this space, that is where the mesangeal cells should be located. My guess is they didn't put them in here because they wanted to show you the entire glomerulus. But this would be the space where those mesangeal cells would be located. So it's got two of our three juxtaglomerular apparatus cells, but not all three. The picture, though, does do a nice job of showing. Again, these juxtaglomerular cells are called granule cells because they're smooth muscle cells that also contain vesicles that release proteins and hormones. Lastly, we have the mesangeal cells. Notice there is a subtle distinction of those that are outside the glomerulus and those that are inside the glomerulus, kind of a location name but their job is the same, increase and decrease surface area. So we're not gonna worry about distinguishing ex, uh, extra glomerular versus glomerular, just the mesangeal cells is fine. And again, these three cells work together for our quality control. All right. Questions on that? Yeah, a little bit. So the distal convoluted tubule comes to the corpuscle and then it goes back? Yep. So notice again, we didn't, we weren't paying attention to it before, but notice they've done a great job of showing us this on the models. Notice here's Bowman's capsule. Here's the proximal convoluted tubule into the loop of Henle, into the distal convoluted tubule. And notice part of the distal convoluted tubule comes right next to the afferent arteriole and then moves away again to the collecting duct. Notice they did the same thing here. Our distal convoluted comes up, butts up against, 
So right here is where we form that juxtaglomerular apparatus and then it twists and turns away again. And Remember we looked at this picture before? We were telling the difference between the proximal convoluted tubules with their dirty lumens and yeah. the distal convoluted tubules with their clean. Notice this clean one has all cuboidal cells, but this clean lumen, notice right here, right next to the glomerulus, Lo and behold, we have a bunch of tightly packed cells and these tightly packed cells right here, right next to the renal corpuscle are the macula densa. So notice we can even see those macula densa cells in the histology. So yeah, so part of the tube comes right up next to it and then moves away. But in that place where it comes right up next to it, that's where the quality control is going to take place. All right. Questions on that? All right. I have thrown a ton of anatomy at you already. So again, we can throw it all quickly together. One last review before we call it a day. Our nephron is made up of primarily four components. Glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule, which has two layers, the outer parietal, that is the cup made of simple squamous epithelial tissues and the visceral layer, the podocytes that lay on the top of the glomerulus. It collects the filtrate and feeds it into the proximal convoluted tubule, which is a twisty and turny tube where most of the processing takes place. As such, they have a large number of microvilli and a large number of mitochondria in their simple cuboidal cells. They feed into our loop of Henle, which has a thin descending limb and a thick ascending limb. The thin limb is simple squamous cells, which as I've hinted at is gonna play a role in helping to move water out of the filtrate. And cuboidal cells in that thick limb, which is gonna move the solutes out maintaining osmolarity, uh, maintaining the concentration of our urine and our blood volume. The thick ascending limb and the distal convoluted tubules anatomy is similar in that they are both cuboidal cells with only a few microvilli and few mitochondria. Remember, this one doesn't quite show up, but there will be a piece that will come up here right up next to the afferent arteriole and the glomerulus, that macula densa. This distal convoluted tubule feeds into the collecting duct, not a part of the nephron, but does have two type, different types of cuboidal cells that can still process the filtrate. And it is indeed filtrate until it finally leaves the collecting duct, at which point it is now urine. We have three types of capillaries we can find in our nephrons. We have the highly specialized glomerulus, tightly packed and contained inside of that Bowman's capsule. It is a high pressure, one way only fenestrated capillary. 
where we make the filtrate. Our only non-capillary blood vessel of the nephron is our efferent arteriole that feeds into the second capillary, the paratubular capillary that wraps around the proximal and the distal convoluted tubules. This is a typical capillary, low pressure, exchanging materials in both directions and feeding into a venule. And some, the juxtamedullary nephrons that have a huge long uh, nephron loop have a highly specialized ladder or lace or lattice-like uh, capillary known as the vasa recta. And as I mentioned, these are gonna play a huge role on concentrating the urine when we are underhydrated. Lastly, we have the three specialized cells that collectively make the juxtaglomerular apparatus. They are the macula densa cells found in the distal convoluted tubule. These are our chemoreceptors and osmoreceptors. They check the condition of the filtrate to, mo to modify it if needed. And we can modify it by changing the amount of blood that enters the glomerulus by affecting our second set of cells. And those are the uh, juxtaglomerular cells or the granular cells. These are smooth muscle cells that also produce and release proteins and hormones. And they can change the diameter of our blood vessel, changing blood flow into our, fil into our glomerulus. And we have our mesangeal cells, these actin-containing cells that can rapidly expand themselves or collapse themselves to push the capillary out or bring the capillary in to change and modify the surface area. And again, these three together form our juxtaglomerular apparatus. Questions on that? All right, that is actually all I wanted to cover for today. We finished a little bit early, uh, but uh, because of that, I will show you one more quick picture. At, this is the simple version of what is going to take, on, uh, take place in the nephron in the processing of the blood. Our quote unquote dirty blood is going to enter into the glomerulus where filtrate is made. That filtrate is then processed in two ways, tubular reabsorption, where things that we want to keep are put back into the blood and also tubular secretion, where things that are in the blood that we don't want to be in the blood are kicked out. After these two processes take place, and they, while they're sequential two and three, they are occurring at the same time. When this process is done, we then have our clean blood going into the cortical radiate vein and working its way back to the heart and all the stuff that has been removed and a little bit of water is our urine and is released from the body or at least sent to the bladder to be stored until we release it from the body. So these three steps, glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion are the three processes that again, form urine, but really their job is to process the blood. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. That is everything that I wanted to do for today.
Uh, we even got in the histology. So uh, I guess that's the nice thing when you guys don't ask a lot of questions. We get through the material faster. Although I prefer the questions. So uh, that is all I have to do for today. Uh, have a good weekend. Study hard this weekend. And I will see you on Tuesday. All right. Questions on that? All right. You guys have a good weekend. I will see you next time. Thank you.